Tony Scott was responsible for many formative action films, alongside the work of his contemporaries such as John McTiernan and Steven Spielberg, of which the style he developed has been adopted by many filmmakers since. The teal and orange look, lovingly shot, gorgeous leads, the quick cut editing style, you could easily argue that he paved the way for filmmakers like Catherine Bigelow, Michael Bay, and Simon West. Starting in commercials and music videos before graduating to features, the way everyone from Michael Bay to Zack Snyder to David Fincher has, Scott brought a kinetic edge and distinct visual eye immediately. Though his first film, The Hunger, was critically derided, Scott's sumptuous visuals were immediately on show, and with his next film, Top Gun, he was quickly cemented as an action director to watch. What Scott brought to the table was both an understanding of visual language and a love for the characters within his films. You can be my wingman anytime. Bullshit. You can be mine. That he would go on to work with writers such as Quentin Tarantino and Shane Black makes sense. Though he may be remembered mainly for how his films looked, that wasn't all he cared about. He knew that for people to give a damn what happened to the people in his action sequences, first they had to care for them. Every decision Scott made visually in his films tied back to his characters and how they affected the story around them. He was a great action director because he was simply a great director. Now I can't say in general that I'm a huge fan of how crazy Scott's editing gets in films like Man on Fire, but I understand it. And I appreciate that Scott believed in his reasons for doing it. It wasn't just about the style for him. It was about creating visuals that reflected his character's psyche and situations in an abstract manner. It does get a bit much, but he had reasons for doing it, and he stood by it throughout his career. So Domino, the whole movie, like it's on the speed, on crystal math, it's all like that. You know, so, um, so that was sty style is dictated to by, by character or by the world I'm touching. I'm not one for auteur theory. But if ever there was a director whose work felt very much owned by them, that everything in the film tied back to the decisions they made, Scott fit that mold. Even in what is probably his worst film, Domino, he spent a lot of time thinking about what he was creating. He believed in the work he was doing and the decisions he was making. Um, and on Man on Fire said, if Denzel thinks it, feels it, I'll show it, I'll communicate it with mm -hmm. use of, and no rules, with use of camera, whether there's a hand crank, mm -hmm. and so if he felt it, I'd show it. You know, so mm -hmm. that was, that's what every movie I always find, I find a concept that I'll, mm -hmm. that I'll, um, that's that one line on top of my storyboards every morning. <laughs> yeah. If he thinks it, show mm -hmm. it. His editing style evolved in a similar way to how his filmmaking itself did. And though you could always tell if a film was a Tony Scott film, comparing his first films to his last films gives you something very different indeed. He was an artist, literally. He started with a fine art degree and studied at London's Royal College of Art before joining his brother Ridley's television commercial production outfit, Ridley Scott Associates. It was this commercial, along with his work on The Hunger, that really helped showcase his potential to Don Simpson and Jerry Bruckheimer and led to him helming Top Gun. And from there, he began to find his calling as a director of action. When you watch films by modern action filmmakers, they all have that real blockbuster look sweeping camera moves and erratic editing style. The heroes are less muscle-bound meatheads, more blue-collar quit machines. The action is less martial arts heavy, more crunching brawls. The gunfights less one-man army bullet fests, more handguns from behind cover shootouts. Scott defined what became the modern American action film. The excess, the gloss, the protagonists. Though others may have had brighter moments than Scott ever achieved in his own career, his consistent impact on the action and thriller film landscapes is undeniable. A director like John McTiernan, who favored generous, carefully planned camera movement over cutting and wider lenses over long lenses to increase geography understanding, perhaps reached a critical action film high Scott as his contemporary never quite reached. However, where McTiernan was unable to evolve, Falling to the wayside and just losing that general ability over time, like so many older film directors, Scott kept developing his own style and his own ability. To the end of his career, he remained a filmmaker with the potential to surprise and entertain. And his final film, though the work of an older man, felt as fresh and exciting as anything else in the cinema. Even today, the big action films by the more well-known action filmmakers are usually considered overblown spectacles. Fun and silly, but hugely lacking in memorable characters and story. And I don't see that really changing over time so much. Scott's films were different. 
His worst of the period, the sequel to Beverly Hills Cop, still revolved around a very memorable character, albeit one established by someone else. And by and large, his films from Top Gun through True Romance to Crimson Tide were either critical successes of the time or have experienced a real resurgence of praise in later years. Scott also remained operating at ground level. His cinema spectacle never went to the level of planes crashing into Vegas or Ferraris chasing Hummers through San Francisco. He was an actor's director as much as an action director. He walked the line between the two. Back in the day when directors would shoot action, it was in a standard perfunctory way. Action was just another part of the schedule that wasn't that kinetic style. When directors became known for shooting blockbuster spectacle, they were hired for that, and usually that only. Your Michael Bay's and Roland Emmerich's, etc. They are by and large solely big blockbuster action film directors. And if you can't get one of them, or you want something to try and elevate your action film, you go for dramatic directors like James Mangold, Mark Foster, or Sam Mendes. Typically, they are not able to or not given the chance to direct the big action scenes, typically instead ending up with a second unit shooting it from all angles and handing the footage over. Either you end up with big blockbusters that simply aren't that great, with characters you don't care about or rushed and overly convoluted stories, or you get films that are generally well directed, apart from the action sequences, which end up as over-edited messes. Scott was a director who had already mastered the craft in commercials, and in feature films what excited him was story and character, with action a way of realizing. He wanted to create beautiful images and exciting action, but knew that story and characters were the ways to ensure that to an audience, those things actually mattered. There's a reason great actors like Gene Hackman and Denzel Washington liked working with him. He knew how to work with them, operating as a great dramatic director, whilst creating sequences of tension and beauty around their performances that elevated the films from simply great films of action to great action films. Unlike some of those he inspired, whose characters were defined by their shtick and their self-righteousness, Scott's heroes were always flawed, caught in situations that both reflected their state and gave them an opportunity for redemption. His stories may not have been original and the themes in them well explored, but he always brought something new to them. He believed in stories. Working in a genre that has always been derided for its style over substance, an attack often launched at Tony Scott, misses much of what he tried to do. His films were always lean and focused, whereas a filmmaker like Bay makes bloated, three-hour-long spectacles, Scott kept his lens tight, literally and figuratively, on stories, on character. He may have loved over-editing, creating riotous, flashy sequences of light and color, but when the film called for it, he knew to slow down and let the performance take over. I shot it very simply. Yeah. I didn't do my, you know, my moving camera and stuff. And because uh, the scene stood up so well, the only thing that I think I, that I brought, which the guys brought in rehearsal, they were laughing. Chris and and uh, um, and Dennis were laughing so hard when they were rehearsing the scene. I brought that sense of humor, which was the only thing that Quentin didn't have on the page. It's written. <laughs> it's a fact. It's written. I love this guy. Scott's understanding of needing a great story meant that he needed great scripts, something he most certainly had an eye for. With films like True Romance and The Last Boy Scout, not only did he choose scripts he knew he could turn into great films, but he then elevated them further. There's a lot more to Tony Scott than his visual artistry, but it is what sets him apart from everyone else. His visual sense wasn't just based on camera moves and speed of editing or even the lighting. He also understood the power of effective production design and location choice, of giving actors something to work with, of surrounding their characters with an atmosphere that would support the performance. What he's gonna do is just add these almost ridiculous visual elements to it that are not on the page, they're not in anyone's brain other than his. And uh, they actually would sound ridiculous if he were to just explain them to you beforehand. I mean, like for instance, in, in True Romance, when he went to see Dretzel and had his little standoff, his Charles Bronson standoff with Dretzel, um, you know, he went to Dretzel's house in my script, which was sort of a, a house in Cass Quarter, Detroit, uh, maybe like a, an abandoned uh, hotel that he, he bought or, or something, it, it, but it's a house, uh, it's his home. 
it's not like a, it's not with whatever that is. I don't know what that is. I still haven't figured it out. Is it a whorehouse? Is it a club? There seems to be about 30 people there, all girls, but people are soliciting people outside. Uh, can you just knock on the door and get in? I mean, you know. Uh... He may have at times brought an excess to his scenes, but it was a controlled excess. He filled the frame with elements, but each had a reason for being there. His films almost move into sensory overload, but only when necessary. A man drinking himself half to death, his mind a chaotic mess of unsettling thoughts, the world around him losing focus, or an opening filled with visual elements, sound effects and score, slow motion, before slowly focusing, removing the sound, bringing us into close upon the lead. Both show the dissolving mental state of each character, but each is very different, and each is important to the narrative around them. And the style, the filmmaking within each, is important to the narrative around them. Scott's filmmaking helped tell the story. Obviously, Scott wasn't a subtle filmmaker. His films are big and brash, the dialogue hard-boiled and thick with one-liners, his gunfights violent and dirty and it's impossible for someone to drive from A to B without causing a car rolling pileup. But that's what you got with him, sort of pure cinema. He was an artist drawn to a medium that allowed him to create both intoxicating beauty and hellish chaos, filled with unique, almost theatrically over the top characters. What the hell is happening? I blew up the building. Why? Because you made a phone call. Just look to his sex scenes too for an example of how Scott was an artist of excess. He's one of the last blockbuster filmmakers that believed in the power of dark blue lit power ballad supported lovemaking. Cinematic realism over actual realism was what fascinated him. Hyperkinetic, not hyper real. He knew when to slow down, and yet his frames are still crafted with the utmost of care. When sped up, big and brash, you can still keep track. And when it's a quiet moment, you still have a lot to drink in. In the tender moments, you don't need to see what is in the background. You perhaps won't notice the shafts of light through a hazy room, but they are there. His visuals feel like score. The way notes play in the background supporting the image, Scott did too with his visuals. At whatever moment during the filmmaking process, he always had complete authoritative control of his craft. I want to go back to a scene mentioned earlier, this opening to Last Boy Scout. This is a sequence where geography isn't so important. The aim is to focus us on an important plot point, one that will drive the narrative from this point on by putting us in the front row of a character's breakdown. There is a lot going on, but Scott always keeps our attention focused on this one character, leading us along this journey. Geography here is flexible. It's not about knowing what's happening in relation to the football field, it's about moving from one destination to another, mentally and physically. The narrative has to make sense, less the geography. Though he does still retain a simple left-to-right direction for clarity. What is happening in the frame is chaotic, but he never makes it hard to follow. If Scott is a godfather of what is now known by some as chaos cinema, his was most certainly controlled chaos cinema. If things got crazy, you still had complete understanding of what was happening. Now contrast that with this very similar opening scene in Con Air, directed by Simon West five years later, that also uses a death in a very visually similar setting to kick off the plot of the film. It's clearly a very similar sequence, with someone violently taking on multiple other characters, albeit in a different way. But it just doesn't work for me. I mean, it does the job, but that's it. It really just feels like it was filmed from many different angles so the flow of the scene could be found later in the edit. Obviously, this is what Scott would do as well. I mean, Scott's was probably filmed technically in a very similar way. But in Con Air, there's less of a build. It just happens. Scott's feels like a journey, building and building, whilst removing elements and focusing down to the final moment. He's carrying us along as the director. It doesn't feel like it's been thrown together. Once he's done, the point is made, we're out. It feels like the work of someone in complete control of the narrative, whereas West's sequence feels like they knew the point of the scene, but not quite how to produce it. They shot everything they could to find later in the edit. Con Air and many of West's other films are clearly inspired by Scott's work, but whereas Scott's images were always well composed and visually sumptuous, even in the relatively mundane moments, Con Air and later many of West's other films simply look a bit flat. 
which isn't really what you want in a big blockbuster film. Scott's images always had depth, even if someone was pressed to a flat wall. Does it mean you have to have tons of visual information in a film? No, of course not. But with the sort of films he was making, Scott simply operated at a higher level and wanted every moment of his films to feel of the same world. Quiet or loud, he gave each moment the same level of attention. Look to his second film as a relatively new filmmaker to see how he had already mastered creating depth in his images, moving the camera versus simply placing static shots and editing between them. When he did edit, he would keep it calm if the moment required it, the characters needing that space to breathe. If it gets turned up, the editing and shots match the movement. Intensity, Scott understood, was still about what happened in the frame versus how he cut around it. A tense dialogue scene was still about the power of the actors, about the power of performance. The camera and editing served that. Editing for him was always about serving the moment, not creating. His rapid fire staccato style may have been controversial, but at least for him, it was motivated. Was every film Tony Scott made great? No, of course not. Hell, they weren't even all that good. Domino, Beverly Hills Cop 2, The Fan. Regardless of quality, what made Tony Scott great was how personal his glossy over the top films felt. When firing on all cylinders, his films were gripping exercises in visual excess, filled with memorable characters. And when less than that, they were still genuinely exciting, cohesive works of a man with a formidable control of his craft. There are obvious hallmarks of Scott's work, from his tense standoffs and violent action to his deep, quiet sunsets and subtly teal and orange colored frames, the erotically charged sex scenes, and his, of course, at times experimental editing style. But of course, there was much more going on beneath that. Throughout his career, he was interested in adrenaline. Like his life, his work feels dangerous. He was a thrill seeker, a man with a love of rock climbing, of pushing himself. He had come far in life, from the drab north of England to the sunset beaches of California. Though he always wanted to make great films for audiences, in the end, he wasn't interested in proving anything to anyone but himself. He pushed himself as an artist as he would in life, always experimenting. Often he would succeed, sometimes he would fail, but he was never boring and he never gave up on his work, on his art. In his films, once broken, disgraced characters, sometimes themselves thrill-seekers, rise to fight their demons, finding love and acceptance in sometimes hopeless places. Their stories were always simple, but still for a mature audience, where everyone exists in a morally gray area. Be it an underdog officer on a submarine, fighting for what he believes in over a man he respects, to a man trying to rescue a marriage he brought to the brink of divorce, amidst an increasingly impossible situation. He loved throwing characters hiding dark truths into sharp, tense situations and seeing what would happen. His cameras drinking in the fireworks, his editing moving with the rhythm of the moment, rising and falling with charged emotion. He knew that in many ways, he was making what some might consider trash, but he reveled in that. If it was trash, he elevated it to its highest form. He knew the characters he wanted to spend time with and his career became exploring their stories as he constantly toyed with the technical side, reinventing himself over and over until his reinvention became his biggest trademark, a clear line visible through his work from beginning to his sadly too early end. Whereas many directors rest on their laurels, become too complacent, can't keep up, lose their edge, he kept himself unique and interesting. Love or loathe his style, he was emulated over and over, always ahead of whatever curve he found himself on. He believed in cinema, in sitting back in a dark theater and taking in two hours of the ultimate art, one that combined sound and image and design and performance. That swinging light is actually something, I think, a great example of cinema. Because there's no reason you should have a lamp that big it looks like on it a, a chain that long in a room that actually appears to have high ceilings. So it, but I don't ask those stupid questions when I'm watching it. And you should. I mean, I mean, it just happens to be down there where Clarence falls and Dretzel's dry humping him. It just happens to be right there. And I don't ask the questions. That's cinema. It works. And when it works, it works. So you don't need fucking to explain anything. From his lesser works to his masterworks, he put his all into every film, staying as unique and brash from the beginning to the end. He cared about how his films were performed, 
He cared about how they looked, and most of all, like any great artist, he cared about how they felt. Cinema is a less exciting, less inspired place without him. But what a gift he was. Seeing Scott's films is like watching a man looking for frills, looking for something for himself, not for anyone else. A passionate artist, pushing himself over and over, setting challenges for himself that we could later enjoy from a safe place. I think I'm a fear addict, fear junkie, fear, fear of failure, and it's fear of failure, creative failure. Um, and I get hammered by the press, I get killed by the press, they destroy me. But he didn't care, he just kept going. Luckily for us, successful or not, he gave every film his absolute best. His legacy is the modern American action film, and though he may have been taken too soon, there's enough energy in his films for a thousand lifetimes. And I, I love this challenge and love this adventure. Yeah. And this was the, this was the, I think one of the biggest biggest adventures and toughest adventures I've ever encountered.